And our Forest Future Salon series has explored a myriad of different organizations, trying to do our best to highlight good ideas out there and learn from the experts and really bubble up good conversations um, for us to both educate ourselves, but also connect the dots within this region. There's a lot of good collaboration happening, especially um, in the forest, but there's also opportunities to continue to weave back um, the different conversations and the different leaders and the different organizations. Next slide. Um, so with that, this is kind of our reality, right? Um, you know, we have an overcrowded, densely packed, dry forest throughout the Sierras. There's hundreds of millions of tons of biomass piled and waiting to be burned, either by wildfire or open burn. And the impacts on our community and communities across California are devastating. Next slide. This is a snapshot of the 2020 fire season. Um, so we had a state on fire on top of a global pandemic. Last year represented, um, last year we saw five of the largest fires in California's history and over 4 million acres burned, which is larger than the last three fire seasons combined. There was 112 million tons of carbon dioxide emitted and unfortunately, this is likely to get worse before it gets better. And so this is an incredibly important moment for us to seize and to um, really get in front of not only the next fire season, but to put some systemic solutions in place, not only for our community, but for the rest of California. Okay, next slide. Um, so the Community Foundation has been in this work for a long time when you think about the nature fund but more focused in the last four years we've been exploring a number of different ways to attract resources to this region including the idea of launching a forest venture lab in which um, i'm not sure i can't see but robert suarez hopefully is um, on the call as well and has done an incredible job with teal zimring um, designing a programmatic strategy that TTCF is currently in a fundraising um, sprint uh, to, to really start to, to build resources towards this. Next slide. Um, so back to the salon series, um, you know, we, we got some feedback from some of y'all that every once in a while our content gets a little bit dense and we agree it's really complicated stuff. And, you know, for those of us who've been around for four years really trying to understand it, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Teal has done an incredible job queuing up and bringing amazing speakers and experts to the table. But this year we really wanted to kind of blend out different conversations throughout this series. And so you'll see um, these three different tracks that we explore over time. And I hope you find it useful. Um, and so with that, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to recognize an incredible uh, group of people who've come here today um, to share on the topic of restoration and recreation. And I want to introduce Teal Zimring, your facilitator for this afternoon, um, who will in turn introduce all of our speakers. So with that, thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you, Stacy. Welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon. It's nice to see you all. Um, it looks like it's sunny where every single person is as far as I can see. So that's kind of a nice refreshing thing today. We have four remarkable people with us who are really um, critical community leaders in this area. And so it's exciting to have a conversation that is so very much focused on uplifting our region um, and so very grounded in this place where we live, where many of us live. John Spahn, co-executive director of the Tahoe Donner Land Trust, background in the outdoor recreation industry. So bringing both of those perspectives to bear today. Thank you for being here. Greg Garrison, executive director of the Tahoe Backcountry Alliance, also a civil engineer focused on large scale flood projects and habitat creation. So again, two really interesting different perspectives um, and a very dear friend. And Jerusha Hall, an environmental planner for North Star, also on the Town of Truckee Planning Commission and the Epic Promise Giving Council. And frankly, ever since I moved here, in basically every forum 
where there are people coming together to drive the future of something in this region, I find Jerusha is often also at that table. And of course, on the board of the Community Foundation and Danielle Bradfield, a professional forester and owner of Feather River Forestry. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you don't have your screen on grid view, you can move it to grid view and our speakers will pop up to the top as they start speaking. Let's jump in. And as we do, please use the chat box actively. You can send questions there. You can send them to me directly. We will track them. We will come back to you. We have a slightly different format today, so it's going to be as interactive as possible. Um, so let's get started. And I think a great place to start is how do you and your organizations view the intersection of restoration and recreation? It is different from each of your vantage points. And why don't we start with John as you were instrumental in helping pull this group of people together. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so the, the, the Truckee Downer Land Trust is a little bit unique in the, um, in the land trust world. There are other land trusts that do this, but uh, not all of them, in that we hold uh, sustainable recreation on equal footing with ecological protection. Um, so uh, it's kind of in every conversation right from the get-go is how can we um, uh, open the property to the public. We even have it in our mission, which is uh, a long one. I like to go with what um, uh, my co-director Perry's son said when he was a little boy. He said, my dad buys mountains for kids to play on. So that's what our mission is. Let's go ahead over to Greg. Uh -oh. Greg, we're having trouble with your audio. You sound a little like a robot that is underwater. That's going to be a good one for Stacy's uh, lead-in later on. <laughs> uh oh! I wish I could record it. That that's fantastic. <laughs> It is pretty good. It's like the intro to like a um, Iron Man type song, right? It's Black Sabbath. Sorry, Greg. Greg, while you get the audio sorted, maybe we'll jump over to Jerusha. How does North Star view the intersection of recreation and restoration? Sure. Hi, everyone. So I, I think, you know, for us, trees, healthy forests, um, a beautiful aesthetic and a beautiful surrounding, um, you know, providing outdoor experiences for people, trying to provide experiences of a lifetime. You know, the forest is really our most valuable resource tied to rec. Um, you know, guests come to be outside in nature. And so, you know, we have to, to be good stewards of the forest to secure our resource until I don't know if you want me to jump into the habitat management plan quickly, or is that too soon? All right. Okay. So I'm just, give me a sec here to share my screen and to share this plan. Can you all see my screen? We cannot. Okay. Um, Technology is not our best friend today. Here we go. Here we go. How's that? Is that big enough for everyone to see? Well, I, it's not coming in in um, like PowerPoint mode. Not sure why that's not allowing me to do that. At the bottom in the orange, like little tr trap. Yep. Uh, yeah. Here. Move over to what looks like a, a slide. There you go. One more over to the right. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. So <clears throat> our habitat, can you see my cursor too? Okay, so our habitat management zones. Um, okay, so here's our habitat management plan. The red is sort of the, the outline of the North Star. We have 8,000 acres or over of privately owned land. Uh, in 2009, we, we moved forward with a habitat management pl plan with some local stakeholder groups. And part of that plan was to sort of lay out a blueprint for how we proceed with land use and planning at North Star. Um, 
And so we have these five zones. Zone A here, which is developed community. Zone B, which is intensive ski area development. Zone C, which is intensive rec. Zone D, which is rec use habitat transition. And then these uh, zone E, which is our habitat conservation areas. Within those areas, we have these different design determinants uh, that we sort of overlay into each zone to see how we're gonna move forward with planning. And as you can see here, forestry management is one of our main design determinants. So, and let me move to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So this is showing, whoop, one, let me go back. One sec here. So this shows um, the fuels work that we've been getting done at North Star with the habitat management plan overlaid uh, on it. The areas in green is what North Star Community Service. Sorry, it just keeps, uh, I won't use my mouse. The areas in green are what North Star Community Service District does. And then the areas in, areas in blue is the work that North Star has been working on. Um, we've been tracking since 2005 with our GAS. They've been tracking since 95. You know, there's been more work done, but this is what we've been tracking. As you can see in the areas in blue, like up in this zone B here, we're working on, you know, creating glades and tree skiing uh, within the trails. We're working on, uh, you know, creating some off-piste areas over here, all to enhance recreation as well as to, you know, to support good forest management. And then as we move out here into um, like the more conservation areas, uh, we're, we're working on enhancement as well as fuels reduction while taking into consideration the array of rogue bike trails out there. So there, there is a nice blending of forest management and recreation and our habitat management plan has really allowed us to take those two two things and, and try and achieve both uh, successfully. So that's a little bit of an overview of, of how that's playing out for us. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Jerusha, a lot to dig in on there. Greg, let's give you a try with your new headset. Yeah, is that better? Perfect. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on. My name is Greg, uh, Executive Director for Tyler Backcountry Alliance. And we're a local nonprofit here in the Tahoe Basin. So um, our, our mission really revolves around act, um, advocating for access in the wintertime to public lands for human powered recreation. So primarily backcountry skiers and snowboarders, snowshoers and cross country skiing. Um, and we we're really focused on establishing trailheads, um, PSAs and advisories on staying safe in the backcountry and proper etiquette and then also uh, advocating for transit options to make sure that, you know, we're reducing carbon footprints and making sure there's other options for folks to get to trailheads other than driving their cars and parking. So that, those are our main kind of focus areas and our intersection with restoration. I think I can speak for, for most of the board members is um, we have a lot of folks that come from the guiding community and, and a lot of people get into that field because, um, we feel like we once you take someone into these environments, they can't help but be conservationists and they can't help but advocate for public lands because it's um, it's a shared experience. And, and so that's really the driving force uh, of our organization. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Danielle, you want to yeah. jump in? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think as a registered professional forester, um, I have a little bit of a unique perspective on that intersection of restoration and forestry because um, as a licensed forester, we're actually writing the environmental compliance documents that would allow restoration and other forest management activities to happen. 
Um, and so I think, you know, first and foremost is that many of us in forestry really want to collaborate with recreationalists. Um, a lot of us in forestry are recreationalists anyhow. Um, and so to us, I think there's a natural intersection of the two because as foresters, we tend to see very long term. Our temporal scale is way off in the future because we know the action taken today is going to have um, hopefully positive benefits, uh, benefits to forest health through time. Um, but I know that that was initial entry sometimes to user groups um, may or may not seem that beneficial. And so I think in terms of that intersection of recreation and restoration, um, really uh, from the forester standpoint is, uh, we just emphasize the ability to collaborate with user groups early in the planning process. Um, because I feel like if we can enhance recreation as part of our overall forest management, that's a win-win for, for everyone. Um, and with that communication line open, then we have the ability to do that. So if it's enhanced skiing, that's great. Um, if, you know, there's a variety of things that can be enhanced, that would be fabulous. Great to know during the planning process. Um, you know, like I said, win-win for everyone, so. Thank you all so much. I'm, I'm really eager to get into the kind of meat of the relationship that recreation has on forest health. And we talked a little bit about this in our advanced conversation together. And John, I know you also have a view to the landscape that you manage and, and work on, uh, prepared for us to, to see. So I think it'd be great to start with you. And, and really the question is, how do you view the impacts of recreation on the health of the landscapes that you manage? And what is your perspective as you approach recreation, um, given that you are a land trust? I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. No. That didn't work. Nothing like technology to just remind us we're there all is. human. <laughs> okay. This will be a two-parter. Um, I wonder if I can also... What happens if I do that? Can you see that? Both maps? No? Just one. One. Okay, I'll, so, um, okay, so uh, we'll start with this one. This is a map of the, uh, a portion of the Tahoe National Forest in 1975. And um, pardon me if, if, uh, if you know the story, but um, this is what we call the Sierra Nevada checkerboard. And the checkerboard is a ownership pattern of every other square mile being private and public. It's a legacy from the Lincoln administration uh, when they, uh, financed the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. The, the U.S. was uh, cash poor but land rich, so they deeded every other square mile, the U.S. government did, to the private entities, at first being the railroad company. Um, then the lands have been sold over the years, uh, mostly to timber companies. And um, so uh, the the Truckee Donner Land Trust, we're, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit that um, uh, raises money and uh, acquires land and um and then opens it to the public and um we've been working in partnership okay i'm gonna stop sharing and try this again i'd really like to get them both up together but hang on one sec all right John, as you work on that. Okay. Um, oh, good. Okay, great. What I what I wanted to ask is for the panelists um, from here on out, if you're able, unmute yourselves because as we continue the discussion, um, I want to encourage you to respond to one another as well. These are the acquisitions that um, the land trust and our partner conservation organizations have done since 1975. Uh, those are the dark green squares. So, um, a, a major uh, campaign of the of in conservation in the area is to um, you know, kind of uh, uh, acquire those private checkers and open them to the public. And um, where recreation lands here is a few different ways. Um, one is that, uh, you know, it's not the case now that, um, you know, a lot of those private squares are owned by uh, Sierra Pacific Industries and other timber companies that do allow public access. But if they were to change hands again and somebody uh, acquired them that, 
didn't want to have public access. We see that a, a fair bit um, uh, in other parts of the checkerboard and up by Jackson Meadow Road. Um, you see fences go up and, and uh, you know, the, your, your dream trail that you want to build might not uh, be able to be completed. Um, access to wildlands for winter sports, et cetera, are, um, and, you know, um, are, are curtailed. So um, that's, that's why recreation is, is one of the reasons why it's so important in our mission. Um, I think that, um, you know, we can point to a few bad intersections with recreation and, and forest health. You know, it's limited to, in my mind, erosion and, 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 and maybe, uh, you know, some human caused fires, of course. Um, but just, I think that um, the most important good contribution that recreation um, impacts on forest health is generating awareness. Um, I think everybody will say that on this thing, but, um, you know, uh, most forest management that uh, the land trust undertakes is uh, funded by uh, state water bonds, which are put in place by voters. And then we apply to for, we apply um, for them for grant funding, and that's how we manage our forests uh, through the Sierra Nevada Conservancy um, and the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and other entities. Um, and then that's how also often uh, how money to acquire these properties come up. The land trust acquires properties with a mix of private funding and also public grant money, and that awareness is just key. You know, having people up here, um, and heck, I imagine that everybody on this call, you know, is here because they like to recreate in the woods and and uh you know that's an important part of of of, of our lives and perspective so yep <clears throat> i'm gonna stop sharing this i think unless anybody would like to look at it longer john Thanks, i love john. that map. i love how much greens on that map that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And now I'm the one with tech issues because I froze during part of what you said, John, but um, but I have seen the map before, so I'm gonna go go from there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. You bet. I can just jump in a little um, bit. Can you hear me too? Oh yes okay. now, gosh. I'll, I'll just keep going. Um some of the, these are a little more technical, um, like I would say, like positive impacts of skiing slash recreation on forest health is um, uh, all the, this is a little funny way of looking at it, but the, all the snowmaking on our mountains serves uh, as an awesome tool for wildfire suppression. Um, and then a lot of the trails and roads, ski trails, that sort of thing, they, they create fuel breaks. Um, and uh, as, as I already mentioned, all the, the, the glading and thinning that we do for tree skiing in an off piece creates, you know, a healthier forest. So there's some good intersections there as well. And you know, also, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I attended this conference in Boise with the Winter Wildlands Alliance put on, and there was a, <clears throat> a scientist that uh, she did a study on on impacts. It, it's not directly related to forest health in and of itself, but it was focused on wolverine habitat and impacts of backcountry skiing and, and motorized snowmobile use in, in wolverine habitat. And it was pretty interesting because she she tagged, she started with tagging wolverines, which is an, an easy task in and of itself. And then she would go to the trailheads and convince snowmobilers and backcountry skiers to wear GPS devices as well. And the end product was this really interesting, imagine Google Earth of, of say, the Teton Range and these lines of influence, these lines of backcountry skiers or snowmobilers moving up into the mountains. And then, and then the, the lines of the wolverines being impacted by that usage and maybe moving away from certain areas and that habitat that the, the wolverines were, were were accessible to was shrinking because of this because of this encroachment or this movement and the zones that those wolverines were impacted by i mean i'm sure there's someone on this call that probably has more um, experience with this study than i do but it it showed how there could be you know some some impacts to recreation that we're not that aren't explicitly aware to us as we're using these places um, and something to be aware of as we uh, plan for the future
you know, something that popped into my head also is that, um, you know, that, that interface with um, recreation and our land management has, um, you know, the, the Truckee Donor Land Trust is a pretty small organization and we often contract out and we always consult experts. Um, and uh, we just, we've been able to um, develop these partnerships with our recreation industry. I mean, thinking, you know, um, uh, we have conservation easements with North Star and, and North Star does the forestry and they, they have the, the expertise to do so. And, um, and, you know, we see that with, uh, with the recreation industry as well, whether it's, um, you know, uh, people out guiding or even retailers that uh, want to contribute to um, restorations and acquisitions um, just because that's their uh, company's, um, what their company likes to, to do. Thanks, John. <laughs> Danielle, you uh, spoke a bit in advance, some of these things that, um, you know, Greg just mentioned unintended consequences um, or, you know, perhaps unintended relationships around recreation and restoration. And in our advanced conversation, you spoke a bit about intended opportunities to leverage your rec restoration work for restoration outcome, recreation outcomes. Mm -hmm. It'd be great to share that perspective. Yeah, in terms of kind of how the two sometimes can happen concurrently. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. 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 I know that, um, you know, jumping right into direct example um, with North Star and I know Jerusha, you had brought this up before, but I know that um, we've done some some thinnings and the prescription I had written was really trying to tackle some of the cytosphora and dwarf mistletoe that was in these first stands. It's just exacerbating itself and causing, you know, mortality that's above and beyond an endemic level. And um, in addressing that, some of the feedback that I got from Jerusha, you know, following the thinning was that there was opportunities for tree skiing that, that came from that. Um, that's a really good example. I'm glad that that was, you know, one of those, you know, wonderful benefits that came, um, you know, like I said, concurrently, we were able to thin the stand and reach objectives from forest health while still providing, you know, recreation on the mountain. Um, I know in years past, I actually had a thinning that happened um, kind of in and amongst a golf course um, and also disc golf, same thing. And so with, you know, meeting with the appropriate groups during pre-planning, it's great. Usually when I meet with these groups, I find that they have trees in mind that they wanted removed anyhow for reasons of the recreation, the sport itself. And so when we can integrate that, um, then it kind of provides a, a, a good situation and that intersection that, that you're speaking of. Um, yeah, so I, I, I could go on and on, but those are some of the examples that come to mind. <laughs> one other thing. Oh, go ahead, Trisha. Oh, I'll be brief. So one other thing that I've noticed is that, you know, there is a way to blend like aggressive fuels management with wildlife enhancement. You know, you can find a balance there. Uh, so I, I mean, that's, it's a, it's, it's great to know that we can do that while, achieving different rec goals and forestry goals. Right. You know, I'm thinking uh, we did a pretty aggressive project at Royal Gorge um, behind it, behind the houses in the wildland urban interface there. And it was, Danielle, wasn't it like 600 stems and acre in places? I mean, it was thick. It was, and, um, yeah. It, uh, I mean, it looks beautiful now. It's a nicer ski and all that. But, but what I thought was really interesting is, um, you know, the, the seed st stock in the ground saw the sun for the first time in years. And all of a sudden it was wildflowers and birds. And, um, yeah. you know, that, that's, uh, that's recreation too. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it is. And John, thank awesome. you for, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for bringing that up because I've always felt like, um, you know, with kind of some of that heavy lifting, you know, some of these initial entries towards, uh, forest restoration, we're, we're really having to make a rather large impact in the stand to kind of support the conditions that we want through time. And so but with that, it's really cool. Like what John talked about, when you have kind of a, a rather aggressive thinning, especially in areas where you are doing fuel breaks and fuel reduction, um, and you get that solar exposure on the floor, and then suddenly you're getting, you know, this whole diversity from native seed stock that's been there and it's just been shaded out. 
And so there's that part of restoration as well that's just really, really beautiful. And I've received comments on that. And I've seen it myself just walking in past project areas, things that I did not see growing prior to thinning. Um, and so I think kind of some of that biodiversity is just, it's so aesthetically pleasing and it adds such a neat attribute, you know, to these areas that we all enjoy. And I think that's another example of that intersection. We also see, um, you know, with, uh, um, with other recreation groups, I'm thinking of fishing groups in particular, and also I hear it's the same with hunting groups elsewhere. But um, you know, uh, particularly with with fishing right now, uh, you read it, you read it even in you know the magazines a lot now how important uh, you know a restored forest that's not guzzling water will return water you know into the stream courses, particularly for you know salmon and steelhead fisheries, and um, you know we've uh, Trout Unlimited has been, um, you know, we've partnered with them on some restoration projects and, 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 and you know, um, the perspective is interesting about how, you know, sometimes it's just we need some logs for the stream restoration, but a lot of times it's, it's more of a macro thing that let's get this forest restored and we can restore the fishery too. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Greg, did you want to jump in before? Well, I know we talked um, when we were when we met briefly before Danielle, we talked about the the utilization of grading and landings that are being you know developed for these thinning projects, and and actually taking those one step further and using those as trailhead development in the future or public access areas. You know the impacts kind of already there. Um, right. it, you know a lot of the heavy lifting is already done, and it, it if if there was more communication from the recreation side in the planning process. Um, it would it would kind of take that one step further, and we could get some more trailheads constructed. And I think that might be a you know one one way to take this one step further as far as benefiting um, both sides of the equation. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And um, just due to the complexity of um, harvest documents with Cal Fire, you know, that planning process is it's always longer than I think it's going to be. Um, it's longer than a lot of people think it is. And so these things don't come together overnight. And so really kind of the silver lining in that is that there is a time period that's that's available. Um, there's, you know, the planning maps that are available where landings, existing landings are, have been located, potential new landings have been located. And so, um, yeah, that communication between specifically foresters and then user groups, I think, would be really handy because, you know, some of the stuff, if we have an existing landing, for example, it makes sense to use it again. But where we're going to do construction, if there is latitude on that given landscape, it'd be great to hear, you know, um, from those in the recreation community about, can we place it, you know? In a slightly different spot if it's going to be of greater use after the you know harvest is complete um yeah i'd like to see all that on the table because I, I think there's potential there and, and we have the time and planning to do that yeah and it would be great to talk a little bit more about the communication side of things i know from maybe not so much the winter side of things but from the mountain biking community that the harvesting and thinning that went on on the, the Sierra Pacific Industries land in the what, behind Truckee, what we call the Yogis and and the Boo Boo Trail Network. Um, it, it was it was really appreciated in the network that they were actually aware that some of the thinning was going on, and and it wasn't as if the community was just saying, "Oh, I can't believe they're logging." It was more like, "Okay, we know they're logging. The signs are up. The clearly communicated and." Um, and, I, and I know that goes on in the Downeyville area as well as Sierra Butte's trail stewardship. They do a good job of communication with the with the community. And, and yeah. it's important because uh, that those recreationalists are, are vital to some of these small towns like Gray Eagle and Quincy. And uh, right. it's really important that that they're that they're made aware of what trails are closed and where else they could ride. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I would agree with that. Um, and just from a safety perspective, yeah. um, it's so important, you know, it's it's so, so important. And I would be lying if I didn't say I've had projects before where there was a road trail and we just hadn't seen anyone on it. And all of a sudden equipment's there and there's the person yeah. that's charging down that thing 45 miles an hour. I mean, they're yeah. gone before you can even catch them. And so um, even from safety aspect, which is really everybody's concern. Um, yeah, just, you know, making the users aware and, you know, like I mentioned, when we kind of had that 
earlier discussion is that in terms of operations, you know, heavy equipment only has so much finesse. <laughs> but yep. that being said, there's a lot we can do to try and really identify where the potential impacts could be to recreation and getting in, getting it done and getting out of that area. So we're kind of minimizing our impacts to that particular trail system. And so, um, again, I think people collaborating, you know, it, it really leads to some great relationships. Um, and I think it also great really helps, helps develop those channels. Then people know who to, who to talk to, who to call. Um, yeah, yeah. They hear rumblings of different projects coming up in different areas. And, and there's, a, there's a little network built around that. So yeah, I'm very supportive also. Absolutely. That's true. There's been a few uh, times I've called SPI and I was like, what? And they said, okay, here's what you heard. And here's what's actually going on. Now go yeah. tell everybody what's actually going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, what's missing is the, is the, on the recreation side, a, a clear voice for certain user groups as far as those impacts and how do you how how best to disseminate that information. And I know we were talking with Truckee Trails and the Truckee Dirt Union, who do a lot of trail building and trail maintenance in the area, of being the conduits for information for things like this and developing those relationships, um, and and how the, those would help the community more broadly. So, um, yeah. I know we, I went out and rode uh, Mills Peak Trail this past summer. This is right out of Gray Eagle. It's a really, really fun trail. It's legal. It's Sierra Butte Trail Stewardship um, did the final construction on it with help of the Forest Service. But they did do a huge thinning project on the lower reaches of it. And and the the trail was, was saved, and but it was flagged. And it was really amazing because it, the, the trail was the, was the, the delineation between the thinning efforts. So they just hadn't done the upper portion so as you're riding up you have this uncleared section of the uphill of the trail then down downhill of it was the thin section is it, it was an amazing way to demonstrate to to user groups like uh, this is what the difference is between an overcrowded forest and a, and something that's been thinned and it was really amazing uh, and it helps with sight lines right as a mountain biker when you're going down a trail and you can see further and it's safer and um, you can see other users on the trail it was great so uh, literally the next question that I really wanted to ask you about is we've named a few challenges, planning, communication, a clear voice for the recreation community to help them understand how best to engage. Um, that's really helpful. And I'm also wondering about additional challenges. And as I was preparing to ask that question, Benji dropped essentially the same question in the chat. So Benji, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the discussion. Uh, it's really great to hear these different perspectives. I was wondering about um, the conflict between recreation and restoration. We, we talked a little bit about when they're aligned um, and was wondering about the opportunities or the challenges when they are opposed. And I was particularly thinking of um, prescribed burns. I once visited Burton Creek and the forester there was um, talking about when their prescribed burn got a little bit out of hand and the smoke went into Tahoe City and the next day there was just a lot of calls and complaints directly even to the governor um, from really affluent families who have those connections. And so the frustration was there that they, you know, want to do so many acres of burning, but weren't weren't able to. And oftentimes it was because of the public. And I think this was maybe two or three years ago. So perhaps the public perception is shifting. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, we need so many thousands of acres of prescribed burn burning done each year. Um, and we're so far from that. Uh, how, how can we get there? And is there a role um, the public can help play uh, in that process? One thing I, I would say, Benji, uh, just again, coming from foresters perspective, um, you know, almost everything that we do as foresters ends up online on CAL FIRE's website. Um, and not all documents have a public comment period, but most of them do. And I know the Forest Service has some, uh, you know, similar mechanisms in place where there's public comment periods. Definitely while that's open, if you are supportive of what's being proposed, make sure you voice that opinion. It's something about human nature. We all kind of 
for some reason, tend to be vocal when we oppose things. But if you're supportive, I would definitely put that voice out there. And even during, you know, project implementation, if you know there's a lot of complaints coming in, um, you know, calls to the agency that is undertaking that project, um, just a little voice of support is very helpful. So that, that's my two cents. Because I, I know when I've had letters of objection to my own uh, force management plans, it's like, gosh, darn it, where are all these people that give me a pat on the back and tell me this is such a great idea? <laughs> you know, they tend to be silent. So I, I would say support the entities that are undertaking undertaking this. So thanks for that. I, um, we so uh, when the Truck and Land Trust uh, acquired Waddle Ranch, which is in Martis Valley, kind of right uphill from uh, Martis Dam. Um, it's uh adjacent to glenshire it's between glenshire and north star basically that kind of lower elevation and um i think that was about 2009 and we uh the forest looks pretty good in there um it looks great now because they're a big project uh worked on it some more but um back then we were considering bringing uh fire back to the forest we uh at that time we were talking about broadcast burns and um and also pile burning and the um the opposition from uh uh, you know, the adjacent neighborhood uh, was was pretty vocal. It, it was not a large group, but they were very vocal. Um, and uh, I remember we tr we put together a panel of fire experts and kind of tried to talk it through. And um, I wish we could do the same thing today because I think in a decade, people's opinions have changed a lot. I mean, nobody wants a wildfire to get out of hand. I mean, uh, you know, uh, a control burn or prescribed fire, any of that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know these big fires and all the smoke i mean that that that's it's you know in addition to all the awful things it's also a pretty big dent on people's recreation plans in the summer so um i think i think people are starting to um maybe look at that as a necessary you know thing so i think that sentiment. yeah that brings that brings to light something that was said to me and some of you have probably heard um and i i try and perpetuate it through my networks and my groups is that I don't think anyone can say they like necessarily having to breathe smoke, but the smoke from prescribed fire is by far easier to breathe than the smoke from catastrophic wildfire. It's mm. less intense, doesn't last as long. And so that's, um, it's just that series of trade-offs. But I think Benji brought up something that um, is a significant topic is smoke. It, mm. It's almost, you know, earns its, its own status as a topic. Um, but I, I agree with John. I feel like that uh, in, overall that the public is more accepting of the practice now than they ever have been. Yeah, it seems like a mind shift um, needs to happen and is slowly happening. And to the extent that we, uh, the different organizations on the call can help with that um, and in different ways, I think is is important part of the process. Thank you. Danielle, you mentioned, um, and John, the, the ecosystem impact um, of smoke. And, you know, the smoke is far better to breathe than catastrophic wildfire smoke. Um, there is a question that Wally had asked, which also relates to ecosystems impact, um, which I'm just scrolling up to find right now. There it is. In whether the treated land responds differently to natural fire than it does to selective thinning. And I think that relates, John, back to what you were talking about um, around uh, trail creation. So while we're on the, the ecosystem impact piece, it'd be great to hear your perspective there. <clears throat> and Wally, sorry, not for shooting that over to your voice, which people would surely rather hear. Um, you know, I, uh, gosh, I would, I would ask um, Jerusha and Danielle this question, but I, it, it, uh, you know, from my perspective, it, it, it absolutely responds differently. You know, I mean, some, some seed stock needs fire to germinate. Um, and then, you know, there's a different kind of nutrient recycling. Um, when, when, when we've done mechanical thinnings, we've either, either chipped the fuels and hauled them off or, um, due to high fuel costs and, long distances to places where we can process chips, we actually broadcast them back in the forest. And that can be a little bit of nutrient recycling. Um, but if you do that too much, you really just kind of modify the fuel load instead of recycle the nutrients. So um, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, absolutely, I would say, but 
I'm the least qualified to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I had a question for Wally in regards to um, treated land. Does that mean land that's already been thinned? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, no, I was I was really just responding to the question or to the topic of how the how the recreation values of the forest change once you once it's thinned. When that the trees are removed, the sunlight gets in, the ground responds, and it now becomes uh, an opportunity is available to use it in a lot of different ways. And I was just curious what the difference between you know removing the trees and creating those opportunities for sunlight to reach the soil. What's the difference between that and what natural wildfire does to the same forest? And I think I, I probably knew the answer that it, you know, that, that process, as John mentioned, some of that seed requires fire um, in order to germinate. But I, I guess maybe uh, I'm curious as to, you know, we have different methods of treating it. Should we be looking at more treatment um, such as burning on site, which does whatever it can do to mimic those natural conditions versus removal of that fuel load entirely out of the forest. Yeah, yeah. I think the risk when you potentially put fire on a landscape that hasn't been what foresters are now commonly called pre-treated, um, there's just inherent escape risk of that fire. So with pretreatment, when we're actually doing removal of a certain amount of material, some of that gonna, you know, will be in standing trees. Some of the material that's removed is down woody debris. Um, when it's removed off site, it creates a condition where flame lengths can be kept relatively low. Um, not always, we always know that managed fire and prescribed fire do escape, um, but we're basically by treating the land, trying to bring it into condition where then fire can maintain that landscape. But for most stands in the Sierras, if you were just to go put fire on the ground now, because of the arrangement of fuels, it's going to go from drip torch to your height to crown, depending on winds, um, and that's the inherent risk. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard, and, and not I shouldn't say that for every acre, but for many acres because of the overstocking, it's just not safe to put fire on the ground without some level of pre-treatment. It doesn't always have to be mechanical thinning. Um, you know, understand a little bit different, but without pretreatment, there's just a great risk of escape. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And just to tag on to those levels of treatment, I know there's some areas um, at North Star where we have extremely high stand density, and it took probably seven or eight different types of treatment over two or three years to get it to a point where it was even, it was open just a little bit. And, and then the dollars that it takes to do, to treat, you know, 25 acres of when you're talking seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 per acre at the end. So, so even though I showed a map, you know, it, maybe it doesn't look like we're getting a ton done and it's extremely costly. And it's also not always easy to find people to do the work. I'm interested to move from the ecosystem impacts on the landscape to the ecosystem impacts on the community. So we've seen a significant increase in recreation tourism. And in fact, Jill, you just posted a question on that topic. Um, how do your organizations view the increased use of forested land? Jill, do you wanna expand on that question? Uh, sure. Thanks, Teal. Um, I'm, I'm mostly curious to can touch on um, uh, just suggestions on how to both manage the, the challenges associated with more people in the forest and also um, capture some of the benefits that we, that we know exist for more people interacting with our public lands here um, locally. Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. We, you know, as a in the winter time, we have, I don't know, 5% of the available parking spaces that we do in the summertime for, for visitors to access public lands. It's, it's just not open. It's not plowed. And when the global pandemic hit at the end of last season, we saw this huge influx as, as the resorts closed, everyone wanted to go to the back country and, and we were kind of overrun. So we started to pair early this year with, um, 
Backcountry Awareness Week, we worked with a, a number of other nonprofits, Take Care Tahoe and uh, TRPA and the Sierra Avalanche Center, to basically put a, a, a public service announcement of, of backcountry etiquette, um, avalanche awareness, where you can get this information, how to park appropriately, and and how to be respectful when you're out there of private lands and private property owners. Um, but that can only go so far, right? Like we we're only we only reached a small portion of the community and and we saw over the course of this winter that Tahoe was pretty impacted by the number of families that came up for just general snow play. I, I'm sure a lot of these, a lot of you have driven down old 40 on the weekend and seen all the illegal parking and everyone just, it was just kind of mayhem all over the place. Um, and there wasn't a lot of management that could be done in these situations. And and not only that, there wasn't a lot of lines of communication to to provide these users, this new user group that we weren't really prepared for with the information. They're not they're not on the normal channels, they're not going to our into our normal backcountry shops where you can have posters set up or conversations about leave no trace and things like that. So um, it, it's not something I think we've totally figured out and, and we're still trying to figure out the best way to communicate that message. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't know that we have a good solution for, for, for harnessing that user, those user groups for benefiting the community as a whole outside of them visiting the community and using, um, restaurants and, and lodging and, and things like that. But, uh, I think it's, I think as the global pandemic is coming to a close, hopefully soon, we'll see a, a slight shift in user groups, but I, I still think our, our, um, you know, the, the impact we're going to see in the Tahoe Basin is going to be pretty immense, and and we need to get ahead of it as far as how we we harness it, just like your your question alluded to. So, open to suggestions, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> it kind of seems like Truckee caught the car it's been chasing forever. You know, it's yes. now we're here, and uh, what do we do? Um, uh, you know, one thing. Um, I'm talking about the Tau Basin, well, in the Donner Lake Basin, there is a group forming um, at the Watershed Council that's uh, really looking at how to, um, you know, how to kind of collectively protect Donner Lake, whether it's parking or enforcing or people, you know, making the dock their own campsite for, you know, days and days, things like that. And and, and that's, that's, that's a, a one way also, um, you know, um, what we hear a lot of is, oh, we need more trails. We need more trails to kind of disperse use. And, and that, um, that's effective. I, you know, on, on a, on a trajectory forever, it's not really effective if the use keeps growing and the trails keep growing. Cause at a certain point you've impacted the resources more than, more than is sustainable. But, um, you know, um, uh, it seems like an immediate need to, to get more, more areas for snow play, more trailheads, and more trails open right away to um, help help manage and disperse the use. Um, and uh, you know, um, as far as uh, making advocates for forestry out of um, out of folks visiting and recreating and, and living here, um, you know, I think uh, you know I. I we're very fortunate that, that the land and the lakes and everything speak for themselves. And, and it's hard not to become an, you know, an, an advocate right away. But, um, but, uh, you know, um, that message, you know, from our, our, from the, the, the organizations and outfits in town that communicate things, whether it's retail or, or chamber or, um, tourism, uh, and in, industries to, um, to, you know, maybe talk about that as well. And they do. You know, so um, continue talking about it. Thank you. This has been such a um, valuable conversation about the intersection of recreation and restoration. And I think it, although we have such intense passion for this landscape, a dramatically growing recreation industry and increase in tourism, we rarely have the opportunity to connect the stakeholder groups solely in service of public education, Benji, to your point, and Danielle, Greg, in fact, everybody, I think, kind of brought up that point. And it's really powerful to have the conversation, I think, that specifically is identifying where there are gaps around public education, around engaging stakeholders. Um, and thank you for that. And I 
want to use this opportunity to ask a question, which is what does community readiness and engagement in restoration look like when collaboration succeeds, when stakeholder groups are engaged effectively? And to set the stage for that, um, we would like to share a very short video with all of you about a particular project in the Tahoe Basin. So Caroline, if you could tee that up, that would be fantastic. We started planning for the Big Jack East project in 2014. It's occurring immediately south of the town of Truckee. We're looking to treat approximately 2,000 acres of National Forest System lands. There's two primary goals to the Big Jack East project. The first is to provide for more defensible space for firefighting. And the second is to create a more a resilient forest to drought, disease, and ultimately climate change, which any resident of the Sierra will tell you we're already starting to feel the effects of. The National Forest Foundation performed fundraising for the project from state, local, and corporate partners, and is implementing the work alongside the Forest Service. The Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation has been an integral partner in educating the local Truckee community about the Big Jackies project. So the relationship between the NFF and the Forest Service during this project is very much one of a partnership. We're relying on one another to get this project done. So the NFF takes care of the contractor procurement. They also manage the contractor day to day and take care of oversight operations of the contractor. So throughout the project implementation, which we expect to be about two years long, there will be intermittent trail closures where we are operating to maintain public safety. We're gonna to try to minimize those trail closures to those areas of operation so that people can continue to enjoy this area. It's a popular spot for recreation and we understand that. And we wanna minimize our impact as much as possible there. The reality is our forests are overgrown and we've got some years ahead of us where we need to be in the forest doing these kinds of treatments. And so Big Jack for us is one of the first that's closest to home. You know, and at the end of the day, again, it's painful to see some of these trees go, but we know this is about the health of our forest and the protection of our community. As we know, change is difficult. The environment that we have invested in by living up here is an environment that is hard to see change. And yet, when you know that at the end of the day, this is really going to protect us and have a healthier forest around us, then our call to action as a community is to pay attention, educate ourselves, and you know, know who to call or where to go when you do have questions about the forest. So I like to think of the Big Jack East in three key phases. The first phase is where we'll be doing the actual mechanical work, dropping trees, and masticating that material, and then bringing it to landings. At any point during that process, the second phase will be kicked in, in which we'll be transporting that material off-site for further processing, and so that could include either saw logs, in the form of actual trees, or to include biomass material which is being taken to Loyalton, uh, produced into electricity. The third phase, which is critical, which is the reintroduction of fire. The reintroduction of fire is critical because it's a natural part of the Sierra ecosystem, and the plants and animals here have evolved to really need fire in order to thrive. So the Big Jack East project really represents a long-term commitment to this piece of ground. Even after the mechanical work and the reintroduction of fire, we're going to need to continue to come back here and either maintain that fuels reduction or allow for fire to continually be reintroduced. I think this project in particular gives us an opportunity to start having these conversations with the community. What I hope is that Big Jack East will really be our first understanding of what this should look and feel like. Thank you, Caroline. 
I dropped this in the chat, but I want to note that Jonathan Cook Fisher from the U.S. Forest Service, who you saw in that video, is with us here as well, doing the queenly wave in the corner on my screen. Thank you for being here, Jonathan. As we open up to question and answer, it would be great to also have your perspective from the U.S. Forest Service on some of the issues that we've spoken about today. So this is our opportunity to hear more voices. Um, and so if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. I will call on you to have your question. And maybe just as a first immediate thing, Jonathan, you and I had a brief conversation about your perspectives on these issues and your reaction to the video and to the conversation today. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Just do yeah. a quick mic check. Great. Well, recreation and restoration are really at the heart of what the Tahoe National Forest is trying to advance. And in particular, the Truckee Ranger District, for which I am the district ranger on, it's, it's at the center of our program of work. It's where our staff is completely aligned. And we like to think that what we've achieved so far in our plans, hopefully in the immediate future, we can demonstrate that we're taking some solid efforts there. Uh, simply put, we can't and will not achieve restoration of our national forest until we've addressed the recreational impacts that we're seeing across the district. And in this particular case, you know, Big Jack East, so what we're finding is anytime we treat timber stands, we're having to come in almost immediately and then treat the recreation or plan for recreational activities. Because once you've opened up that forest, you're just going to have a different user experience in a different group of folks who uh, want to explore the woods differently, let's just say. So in 2021, we're going to be starting our Ladybug project. That's east of Stampede. That's another 2,000 acre project. And with that comes our East Zone Connect trails project. So we're coming in after each of our veg projects planning for trails, trailheads, and a bunch of activities. Um, but just kind of building on the general theme here today, uh, which is, you know, Truckee is, I would say, really at a crossroads. And that crossroads is between, I would say, an urban, a more urbanized national forest, uh, in which we feel like we are constantly responding to new uses or unintended or unplanned for activities or we as a community rally and figure out a way to plan, fund and implement the right trailheads, parking lots, support facilities, trails to accommodate this use. So those would be some general statements. Thanks. Reactions from the panelists, if any of you would like to jump in. What are the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jusha. I just wanted to mention that I was so impressed that as part of that project and Allison Pedley with Truckee Trails is on as well, but as part of the Big Jack project or in concert with, I know a lot of um, trails and sensitive areas got decommissioned and that sort of thing. And then you came forward with the Big Chief Trail and the Sawtooth Trail to create, you know, more established trails, excellent trails that the community loves you know, so so you made everybody happy. You know, you 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 made these great trails happen, and you got rid of a bunch that really didn't need to be there. So I I just wanted to say thank you for that. Do appreciate those comments. I can assure you, we didn't make everybody happy, uh, but uh, we we know we were doing the right thing. And at the end of the day, we're pretty proud of the efforts we we did out there. You know, Truckee has over 200 miles of system trail currently and over 200 mile of non-system trail. So trails that have just been created by users. So right now it's really split between unauthorized and authorized trails. And I can share with you many, many of those unauthorized trails are significant issues for us because they directly intersect with t &E habitat or archeological sites and things of that nature. So it's an ongoing issue and we will continue to take every opportunity we can in these big landscape projects to plan for a more sustainable trail system. I was curious, you know, the, the Tahoe Donner um, trail network that they have behind there, and, and I'm not, I'm not too aware of, of how the ownership plays out on that land. I know it's privately managed but they have a lot of sensitive habitat, the Ewer Valley and the, the, the watersheds of the upper Prosser Creek. And they also have a pretty extensive 
um, trail network and they and they seem to have a pretty aggressive uh, thinning project and, and forest rehabilitation projects going on are are there limitations to the, the to the public lands that that the private um, these privately owned parcels are not subjected to that that become roadblocks or or that kind of interaction or is it more of a funding issue that becomes the roadblock? I'm just curious what your perspective is on that. If I understand the question, it's I think you're pointing to perhaps projects on private land and then wondering why that same pace or intensity is not occurring on public lands. Yeah, I guess it's more. Yeah, I, that that would be one. I just I just know that they they seem to be really aggressive with with all three elements of, mm -hmm. of the, you know, restoration, the recreation and the forest health and thinning. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I know from, from my experience working in, in watershed restoration projects, it's, it, there, there are a lot of roadblocks from just the, the administration side of things and, and that, that become a challenge. Um, yeah, I, all I could, all I could offer is perhaps that it's, it's, um, our portfolio is much larger, and so perhaps it's not always as obvious uh, that we're making either the same or more level of investment. Yeah, a lot of our resources are shared across the zone, and so we're helping out from South Lake all the way to Downeyville, you know, the same trucky mm -hmm. crews. So it, we prioritize based on a variety of factors. I would say on the recreation side in the last two years, We've made some unbelievable strides in recreation. I mentioned this East Zone Connect project. I mean, it's 70 new miles of motorcycle single track. We should take some pride that we're going to be the first district, not just forest, but Truckee will represent the first district in California to authorize Class 1 e-bikes on non-motorized trails. And that's going to occur this spring. Um, so we're going to be the first out of the gate. I know Lake Tahoe got a lot of notoriety this last week because they're releasing their plan. But we're we're already there. Uh, our campgrounds last year were open longer than they've ever been. So we're making some important strides. We've identified a number of potential immediate improvements in our trailheads. Um, but uh, I, I think the future is ripe here for a group like this to really advance this conversation. Thank you. And with that, others, I invite you to unmute yourselves. If you have questions, we uh, can kind of open this up. So please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and jump in or raise your hand if you prefer. And if no one jumps in, I will. Okay, so there was a topic that um, came up in the chat, which we haven't really dived into. And part of me wants to, uh, it, you know, Sachi, I wish that you had been with us um, in our policy conversation last month to ask about financing gaps. But as it does relate to your work, um, Greg, Jerusha, John, and Danielle, within the intersection of restoration and, and recreation, um, let's go ahead and ask that financing question as well. Sachi, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, I'll take myself off me. Sorry, struggle bus this afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sashe Kanthu. It's actually really nice to meet uh, many of you for the first time. So I think just reflecting on um, some of the opening slides around the, the scale of the issue and, and full transparency, I'm a learner, um, but I'm also a grant maker. So always really interested in being able to <laughs> facilitate the connections both at the community level, but also at the resource development level. And um, John, that checkerboard was also awesome. I'd ne never seen it before, but I thought you made a really interesting comment around um, particularly bonds through the, um, the, the state water bonds. So just, um, again, not having a familiarity with the scale of the cost of this work, but um, being able to understand at a high level if there are any obvious gaps in terms of where you see people funding or financing this work, um, either from public sector, corporate, if you guys are doing program generating revenue to look at this work, I'm, I'm really curious to, 
um, hear who is at the table, but also who is conspicuously absent, if you if you may. So thank you for having me and thanks for entertaining my question. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, primarily, so when the specific to the land trust, when we acquire a property, um, we, you know, we have a capital campaign that focuses around the acquisition, but um, we budget for stewardship uh, in that campaign and we raise past the, um, you know, past the purchase price. So we have money, um, you know, that if, if we can complete the whole campaign, we have kind of a quasi endowment that, that, that uh, can spend money out um, to do some level of management um, but we are heavily reliant on grant funding. Um, that might get us a THP or the first round, but um, you know, there's, it, I mean, it, it, we could do this all day, every day. And as soon as we're done with one and we got to turn around and start again. So um, that, that's, we are relying on public funding and those, um, those bonds have been key for us. I mean, almost all our forestry projects have been, um, have been uh, public funding. Uh, we've also done some, the, 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 the challenge with the larger, um, you know, with, with the, the state bond money is it needs to be a large enough or um, critical enough project to to be, a, a you know, a, um, fundable because there's everybody needs the money. Right. Um, so uh, a lot of our smaller um, wildland urban interface projects, we um, we, you know, donors have been generous. Uh, the, the local foundations have been very generous and, and able to do that. But um you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's, I mean, we, we are reliant forever on, you know, funding at the public funding at the moment to, to manage our forest. Yeah, no, it's just kind of an interesting rub with the, the work being so long-term, but also the fundraising being, you know, immediate and re repetitive to be able to get it to a point of, of being, um, you know, sustainable, whether that's with multi-year support or having to go at it each year when you're talking about um, the, the need for this work um, to continue over the long term. So I, I appreciate your comments. Yeah. Thank you. And th th you know, it, what, one more thing too, what's weird, I, I, my coworkers would strangle me for saying this, but um, right now <laughs> funding is not the number one challenge, at least on the short term, it's actually available operators to do the work and then a place to take the product and then fund it. So I guess it's mm -hmm. all. Yeah. And I wanted to jump a little bit on a place to take the product. Um, you know, these a lot of the local contractors, they they have to haul their their waste to the landfill, um, and then it either gets buried or hauled somewhere in 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 Nevada. Or maybe, or maybe to Loyalton if when that's operating. But that's a big, big concern is that there's no place, there's no wood lot, there's no place to actually address all the biomass um, associated with these projects. And if there, if there were, there would be an opportunity to potentially reduce costs. Another thing that um, little tidbit I can throw in, it's not earth shattering. Bruce is saying is with so much of this restoration, you're taking what is otherwise um, such a low value product out of the woods. Um, and, you know, some of these stands have, you know, upwards of 1800 cents to the acre and some of the most overgrown stands where they really need to have 50 to 100 cents to the acre. So when you look at what's being removed, um, kind of one of the basics in forest economics when it comes to removal is how many parts are you handling? Because the cost of it grows exponentially with the more pieces that you're handling. And so when you look at it, these entries are just costly. We're dealing with small material and a lot of pieces of small material. So it's like pickup sticks um, with very, very um, expensive equipment. And so the, the economics are a little bit upside down. And I know, Jusha, you had hit on that you know, in some of your other comments as well. Um, it, it's just highly expensive work to be done. And, and yes, not many operators. It's hard to attract people into that profession. I'll make a comment on 
financing. Um, I was prompted by Teal, full disclosure. I'm not, I'm not stepping on your panel, but um, <laughs> it's also really important to note that the, the while the public funding is very important coming out of the state water bond, the majority of that state water bond, and I, I meant to pick the figure 98%, it's, it's a very high percentage, actually went to more of the coastal communities. It, it, the money tends to go to where the, um, the water exits the system. And it's really important when these bonds come around that people in rural and forested areas help educate uh, this really important connection between rural and urban communities. And all of the assets in these forested lands do impact the quality of life in California from water supply, from our recreation, um, the natural assets of timber and biomass power, those all are used by urban communities. And it's, it's a constant struggle that we go through to educate why it's so important because the, the, the voter pool is in the urban community. So it's very, very difficult to get these types of bonds passed. Thank you, Kristen. I did prompt her. When expertise is here and present with us, we should tap it. <laughs> So thank you for jumping in, I appreciate that. We are going to pivot um, and try something new and try something different, or if you're a Monty Python fan, and now for something completely different. We are going to send you an invitation to a breakout room. Please accept that invitation. You have been placed in small groups. You have a couple of questions to answer together. When you come back, which will be brief, um, 15 minutes or less, we would love to hear the top couple of ideas that arise during your discussion. And each discussion does have someone who knows what those questions are, so I won't tell you them now. So please accept that invite. Did we get left in the main room? <laughs> Ashley, hi. For some odd reason, you're not showing up on. Oh, I'm um, like on the in the system. Oh, now it is. It's so. It was the strangers. Uh, I did. I did unfortunately have to join late, so that maybe I wasn't in the system. Maybe yes. No worries. Here we go. Tim. Did you receive an invite? Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> but, I, but I'm, uh, I think. Okay. I'm, oh, here we go. Yeah, I did. I just... Jamie, are you still there? Jamie?
Hi, Ella. Hi, I just booted myself out of my breakout room because the thing popped up and I accepted it. Oh, it's okay. I can't put you back in. Is that okay? They can, it's all good. It's fine. Um, yeah, whatever, whatever you want. I got great stuff. <laughs> okay, awesome. Take all the trash. <laughs> Thank you. That was so fun. That was great. Everybody, here we all are. Amazing. Um, this is really a chance to report back out and to share some of what you just discussed. Uh, so, who would like to begin? I'm not. I, don't, I won't nominate my own group right up front. <laughs> like someone on the spot, Allison. I see you waving. We had a terrific group who came up with a lot of fantastic points and a lot of great ideas. Um, I think the the gist of what did the panel bring up, I think a lot of people had comments around educating their friends, educating their peers that, you know, these projects have been done and people in the community complain about it, don't really understand it, and there's still resistance. And so I think a lot of the stakeholders felt that it's their personal responsibility to try to educate people who don't understand why, say, a Big Jack project were, would be done, for example, or other. Um, we had a couple uh, members who really shared that they do feel a personal sense of responsibility to share education about forest health. Um, we had another member who I had a really terrific idea because we also went to the ideas that hadn't been brought up and a question about um, why for our force, for example, aren't isn't the national park model, for example, being used where you pay a fee to go into the national park, but there are also nonprofits surrounding that where when you're in these beautiful spaces and you feel inspired, you can give more. That there doesn't seem to be that opportunity or that the basin isn't taking advantage of day users uh, to capitalize nonprofit dollars for forest health. So those were a couple things that came up. Um, and specific examples were brought to bear of other places doing things like this. Thank you. I see, oh, no, that wasn't a hand raised. I'm gonna nominate uh, Jim Boyd from our group. Well, thank you. Since I didn't know I was gonna be nominated with 30 seconds or less, I didn't take copious notes. So you're gonna have to rely on my memory and my prejudices. I'm Jim Boyd, representing the Tahoe Fund in these sessions. Uh, and forest health is our number one priority. But as I said to our group, forest health and recreation go hand in glove. And I think the public is beginning to recognize that um, more and more. Our public, our I mean, we are a philanthropic organization just raising money from, from people, the public, uh, people in the public and, and uh, in, uh, and and what we're seeing is people more and more recognizing that and willing to give money to help the forest, recognizing it'll help recreation, help the forest because it, oh, wow, it's going to minimize the possibility of cata or reduce the possibility of catastrophic fire, which would therefore impact our recreational opportunities and in our case impact, you know, the quality of, of the lake uh, proper. Few people begin to recognize the other values you get, such as improved water, quantity, quality, so on and so forth. But um, our group did raise the question of are user fees a possibility with that 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 isn't being tapped enough, but we also recognize that you know, dare you raise that question to users 
or to maybe some politicians. Um, and it seems too much as, as a tax and it's difficult to, to put in place. The other thing we've recognized is even though people see the interaction and the economic benefits derived from doing some of these things versus costs that have to be expended in future years to fight a fire or to rehabilitate a forest or to take care of seriously damaged recreational facilities as a result of of a fire or the consequences afterwards of fire um and and a, even though there's that recognition um the uh, public financing operations of of state governments and the federal government are not providing the money um to address those issues uh, in, in deference to many other things so I mean, we see we have a dilemma, and, and, and I just know in California from years of experience, we have a lot of policy dilemmas, a lot of rhetoric, but then don't back it up with policy. Um, there are huge, there are huge um, hurdles to erecting a few more sawmills or, or really facility, facilitating forest biomass use for other valuable things. So we have a big educational problem folks if we want this address. That's what I took from our group discussion. Also, it was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, so Jill, how about your group? Sure, happy to go next. Um, my group had several great ideas that I also didn't take notes on, but I know someone was, I know Ella was, so um, mm -hmm. feel free to chime in group and help me elaborate, but um, uh, yeah, so we kind of we kind of talked a lot about how recreation allows folks to be out in the forest and really engage with um, some components of forest management and better understand them and um, and from from better understanding the need for them to recognizing um, we, we talked about how over the last few years, it's been more and more common to recognize what a pile of wood in the forest means. It means that forest is being managed and taken care of. And um, it's just becoming, um, you know, more of a understood norm in most circles um, from folks who get outside a lot. Um, and so that's, you know, just exciting to see. And then also we talked about, um, Danielle had a great point about tours in the forest and, and giving um, tours of project management sites um, and how, like allowing the public to ask questions about um, certain projects and um, and really understand the why and the how and the what of forest management at a, a, a personal level. Um, feel free to jump in and elaborate, team. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the tours were um, something that we brought up consistently in terms of helping folks visualize and immerse themselves in what sort of projects are going on in the forest, in towns, in terms of processing facilities. Um, and then also a great point that was brought up, I think, by Jerusha's before and after photos, just something so simple as, you know, a really stark Dif differentiation between the projects before and after state can do so much in terms of educating the public about what's going on. Um, we talked about a couple other ideas, just the keys to, you know, public awareness and education will help people understand and kind of justify what's going on with force management, as well as satiate their curiosity, because most of the time they just are curious. All right, Jeff and Megan. Um, our group, you know, sort of echoed, I think, what Allison said, you know, a lot about uh, raising awareness and education of, of activities in the forest and conservation efforts. Um, and, and just, you know, I think just talking to your neighbors and your, your friends and, and just raising awareness. Um, we had a couple of specific ideas. Uh, one is, um, you know, engaging the insurance industry um, in this effort. And two, um, there was a question as to uh, whether we've had someone from the irrigation districts at any of the salons, um, because they obviously have a vested interest as well. Caroline, did I miss anything? 
Nope, that was pretty much it. Yeah, as far as awareness goes, we did talk a lot about how um, it's important to start young with kids and educate them and be good steward. Um, and yeah, just education at a young age can really create impact. Thanks. Megan, are you here? I see you. You have cows behind you. I'm right next to you. Uh, those are the bison in Golden Gate Park. But but cows, sure, that's fine. <laughs> we can do that. I've got, so from our group, we had the, um, the just one of our, the things that we noticed is that we're not talking enough about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and who's actually using the forest and who are we preserving our forest for? And just wanting to continue to lift that up in the conversation. Uh, we want to understand what opportunities might be available related to the usage of recreation and to generate revenue that supports the restoration side. So how can we do a better job of linking linking those two opportunities? Uh, can we, we the extent and, and to what extent is rec the recreation industry a stimulator of using thinnings for an economic value? Um. The local, uh, we talked a lot about how just this, you know, one of the things that COVID did is it brought a lot of the local nonprofit organizations uh, to work together that don't always do that. So how do we continue to work with them to engage the forest service and that work and, and continue to build those relationships and those connections? Um, we had some conversation about, you know, responsibility for the WUI and what does it take to, for folks who live there and have purchased homes that are there, what does it really take to, uh, in, ensure that sort of shared responsibility for the land and for some of uh, our more fragile ecosystems. And the idea of through restoration, what can we do with some of the nomad camps with the, this, which is an idea of what some of the increased demands might be, you know, on some of the camp, the existing camping areas, what can we do to open up more spots to really encourage more people to kind of spread out where they're where they're spending their time in a in a safe and sanctioned way i think those are that that's what did i miss anything team is that the the last of our the last of our notes i saw a lot of thumbs up okay thank great. you all okay. so much thanks for for doing that with us um i can't tell you the number of notes that even just from this conversation the things that have come up start young awareness federal budgets out of whack with the incredible size and growing size of the recreation industry, 2% of the GDP dwarfing other economics, other industries, excuse me, insurance, irrigation. Uh, you know, it's really remarkable. Um, I'm sure there are experts in all of those places. And what I'll say is we'll go find them <laughs> and we'll go learn because I think that's exactly the reason for which we come together for these salons. So Thank you, Stacey, for making this possible and bringing us together and, and over to you. And thank you to our panelists, yes. lest I forget to say that. So yes. much for being here. Yes, so definitely I wanna thank Danielle, I wanna thank Greg, I wanna thank Jerusha, and I'm looking on my, help me out, Teal, who, who else am I thanking? John. 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 Thank you. Sorry, what do I do without a PowerPoint to rely on? Um, that was such a great conversation. I absolutely love hearing these stakeholders come to the table and really kind of think through that with us. And it's, I think, the first time we've actually explored this conversation. Um, and if, if not the first time, definitely not in this level of depth. And then the crowd, you know, the wisdom of the crowd in those breakout sessions, I think we were all just taking copious notes because there's a lot of actionable things that are there. And I welcome um, any of the participants and, and certainly any of the, the speakers today to engage with us at the Community Foundation and, and let us, you know, kind of, if anything really sparked your interest in these conversations, how we can continue to kind of um, move them forward. So... Uh, with that, um, I want to thank our team, Caroline and Tamia. Um, I think Allison was on earlier. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, Teal for all her hard work. We also have Allison and Ella have, have helping us out behind the scenes and giving us good feedback on these particular um, salons and how we can really kind of bring them to life and keep them 
keep them going in a way that are re that's really helpful for this Forest Futures work. So um, with that, I think we are adjourned. Oh, no, we're not. Don't go. Uh, put that PowerPoint up and show everybody the next meeting. Caroline, you got to you got to like just roll over me. <laughs> um, the next salon is going to be so much fun. You need to go buy this book, The Journey of the Trees. It's going to be kind of a book club esque, but we actually have the author joining us for the salon. Teal, do you want to add something? Say that this is, you know, this is our new effort at expanding the way we're thinking about what the purpose of these salons is. And one of them is to understand the history of the lands in which we live. We talk about our deep passion for this place. And I'll tell you, in my conversation with Zach St. George, I have never heard someone speak so poetically about a tree. And I think it will be a very interesting, different approach to the forest lands here. So hope to see many of your faces there. Please, please do join us. Um, yes, our local independent bookstore is offering a discount. Um, you can order it from the comfort of your desk and it can get delivered to the bookstore. Um, but more than anything, we'd love to just engage you in this next conversation. And then there's a couple others coming up. So mark your calendars and we'll keep you posted. Awesome. All right. Now we are adjourned. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs> Good to see you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Take everybody. care. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.